Right, listen up. Before we kick off, I'm going to moan about some fights and you're going to be mad about it. But know that I was extremely positive in my detailed breakdown of Alexandra Pantoja, who's fighting for the title this week, which you can read on the Patreon right now. I will also be extremely positive about the Rise card and the UFC Grappling Invitational, which I will also write about this week for the Patreon boys. Now, let's moan about some fights. Oi, oi, it's your boy, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday the 3rd of July. And we had a- another mid-UFC event, <laughs> another one that wasn't particularly stacked with names, but mercifully, lots of knockouts. It did mean that the BT Sport, when I went to watch it the next day, five and a half hour running time, included all the prelims too, not much of that was actually fights, just huge amounts of adverts. And that's the reason I don't watch it live, partly because I'm British and if I stay up, I'll have to be up until 6am, um, and partly because I don't want to sit there and be advertised to the entire time. I'm already being advertised to enough during the fights. But uh, it was night of a million fraud checks, is what happened. <laughs> Lots of people who should have won, uh, pretty soundly lost. And I, you know, I wouldn't call all of them fraud checks. The one that I would call a fraud check is the main event, because Abus Magomedov, I mean, I was talking about this. If you didn't see, pre-fight, I didn't do a boycast. I did a playthrough of Sifu, or a playthrough of the first level of Sifu, which uh, I was struggling to remember how to play. But uh, I just played that and talked over the top about this event because I cared about this event so little. But um, I watched the Boost Magomedov's PFL fights, a few of them uh, coming into this, and I referenced, you know, famously he got knocked out by some 41-year-old with a left hook very, like, 30 seconds into a fight before leaving the PFL. Um, but, like, he beat Sadabusai, uh, who or C Sadabu C, who went on to win the million dollar prize in the tournament, um, and is is doing quite well over there. But uh, he beat Sadabu C in a fight where he struck for the first round, very clearly got tired, and then wrestled for two rounds. And I was I was saying, oh, that's not great, you know. And I didn't say this on the broadcast, but like, if you're a kicker, you already have a super high, um, a super taxing style on your gas tank. Do some fucking cardio, mate. Because he turned up and he kicked the shit out of Sean Strickland through one round. And just as he landed a, a nice head kick uh, through Strickland's guard, he went, oh, I'm bollocks, I better wrestle. <laughs> Literally landed this kick, immediately dived on the takedown, got on Strickland's back, and then the next round he just had nothing. He threw something like 17 strikes in the second round and landed two. Absolutely pitiful. Really just pathetic stuff from a guy who was headlining a, a UFC event, a card. And this isn't a short-notice fight. Abus Magomedov had months to train for this. He's had his life to train for cardio, and um, he still gassed out in one round. That's absolutely desperate for a professional fighter to gas out in one round. You know, granted, heavyweights, it's expected, but this is a middleweight. Having said all that, UFC 292 in a, cup, in a month and a bit, that's going to be in... Utah, and everyone's going to gas in one round. And we're going to be like, maybe we judged Abu Smegamidov too harshly. But yeah, I mean, you know, Sean Strickland finally gets a finish because he's not got a finish since he was a welterweight, I believe. Oh, it might have been Brendan Allen, his last finish, which is a really surprising one. But yeah, you know, got, got his ass beat in the first round for all the reasons that he should. You know, uh, reaching for things wildly, leaning back at the waist. A kicker is, is something troublesome for him because he reaches so much for things and you can't really reach for kicks. If you watch the head kick just before the attempt, uh, the takedown in the first round, uh, he takes two good kicks to the body, a front kick and a, uh, a round kick to the body, and both of them he's reaching wildly for the kick. So he just gets his hand back in time to get kicked through it with the head kick. But um, you keep throwing kicks at this man. He's going to have a horrible time. You keep throwing body shots of any kind. In the second round, when Magomedov was completely gassed, his back was to the fence, he's getting his ass kicked by Strickland. He throws two different body shots, it's, you know, single body shots, no setup, no combination. D twice he throws a body shot, Sean Strickland takes it and goes, ooh, and backs off, and then comes back in. This is a dude who wants you to throw punches at his head. Because that's the thing that he can deal with the easiest in the world. If you throw kicks, they're too long. If you throw kicks and he reaches for them, or he's trying to parry them with his hands, they go through. If you kick his leg, he's very rarely in position to check. He took a load of calf kicks in this fight. 
I'm going to check the stats, actually. Abus Magomedov, 10 for 10 on low kicks. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, high kicks, obviously. But, like, the, the whole thing. This fight, the reason that the high kick almost brained him in the first round was exactly the same as the Pereira left hook. If you poked this guy in the body, Magomedov was doing it with his front kick and his round kick, which are both, you know, he's got a really good front kick to the body. Um, Pereira was doing it with body jabs. But if you poke this guy in the body, he starts reaching down for it. And then you can chin him. But this also summed up one of the things that I hate about Strickland, even when he's winning. Have a listen to these stats. 80 for 186 to the head. Okay. One of two to the body. Zero of zero to the legs. You have a dude who's gassed as hell along the fence and you just run after him throwing pity pat punches at his head instead of digging some nice body shots. It's a testament to how bad Abus Magomedov is that he fell down, honestly. But well done to Strickland. Um, gets a finish. They did have to bust in some no-hoper for him to do it, but, uh, you know, he's had a couple of tough ones because the Pereira fight was rough and then he had the um, Cannoneer fight where he lost the split decision in a fight that a lot of people thought he'd won. And Cannoneer now is, like, gearing up for another shot at the title off that Vittori win. Anything more to say about that fight? I mean, people might be salty that I'm not giving Strickland more credit, but the guy gassed in one round, not from being hit in the body, from throwing his own fucking strikes. That's insane. Magomedov, that is. Strickland didn't. One thing about Strickland, always in shape. Gotta respect that. Especially above 185, actually, because that's my massive complaint all the time. These fuckers just coming in, being gassing at me and being like, well, I am a big lad. <laughs> Just, like, that excuses it. Disclaimer, I didn't watch uh, Romanov versus Blagoy Ivanov because, of course, I didn't. That sounds terrible. Uh, I did win a load of money betting on the decision because, apparently, a load of people thought this wouldn't go to the decision. It's Blagoy Ivanov. He's got to the decision in, like, every single one of his last 15 fights. That man got so much goodwill off a Sambo win over Fedor because this was back when everyone was convinced that Sambo was actually the best base for MMA, which now they are again, actually. But it was like, whoever wins the World Sambo or Combat Sambo Championships, they're the guy to watch. And Blagoy Ivanov managed to beat Fedor for the first time in like five years. Fedor had been doing it. And uh, then he just turned out to be an extremely mediocre UFC heavyweight. Well, actually, mediocre enough average enough that he's literally just in the middle he wins enough that he stays in the ufc nobody wants to watch him they managed to put the heavyweight the first fight on on the prelims when do they ever do that that's how you know it was going to be a stinker even mick maynard who's completely clueless knew that was going to be a stinker but there was some good stuff on this card um a couple of those aforementioned fraud checkings grant dawson versus demir is magalov really impressed by this because grant dawson's striking is dog shit generally uh, if you watched him against jared gordon Jared Gordon lit him up. And I know we're off, we're all hot off, off the win over Paddy slash loss to Paddy, uh, Jared Gordon. But he's very, like, ho-hum. You know, he's got a right hand, he's got a left hook. He's not tremendously sharp. But he was giving Grant Dawson hell. And Grant Dawson won that fight by getting a double leg in each round <laughs> and then just getting on his back and finally getting the choke in the third round. Um, but Grant Dawson's wrestling is off the chain, mate. Uh, he fought Marco Madsen in his last one, uh, you know, Olympic silver medalist, and just stuck to him. It was really impressive. Wrestled all over him. And I said this on the boycast, but like he said, oh, we were working on low shots because he was an Olympian in Greco-Roman. But like, you know, anyone who trains Greco-Roman trains another form of wrestling first where shots are allowed. Um, and anyone, or typically does, and then adopts Greco-Roman to compete in the Olympics or whatever. But um, even then, he'd been a mixed martial artist for 10 years. You know, the, the Olympics was 10 years ago. So he knew how to stop a shot. So Grant Dawson... Out wrestling him was, was far more of a feat than he quite humbly said it was in the uh, post-fight interview. But here, man, man, is Magalov very technically shot, a little bit limited, like only goes to a few things, the jab, uh, doesn't really open up the combinations very much, doesn't really use his kicks enough. Uh, you know, strong takedown defense, strong take, like basic takedowns when he goes to them, strong top control, but um, very... Solid. I thought Grant Dawson was going to have a horrible time and just made, be made to look bad. Like a, a typical Musasi versus guy who can't wrestle very well fight. Except Grant Dawson can wrestle very well. But his Magalov can wrestle too. So I was, my, my thinking was, you know, when Musasi manages to keep someone standing and just jabs their face off. Musasi versus Latifi, let's say. But it wasn't that at all. And he didn't even have to work all that long 
to get his takedowns. Against Jared Gordon, he got lit up. And then eventually he would get his takedown. And it, it took a lot of guts to get there. This one, aside from the second round, I think Demir was able to open up a little bit. But Dawson just head outside single, which we're always talking about in MMA. High crotch, you know, depending on your terminology. But when you shoot with your head outside the lead leg and you, you pick up the lead leg. Sometimes you don't even shoot, shoot, you just reach down and grab it. But with your head outside the lead leg, um, you, you mean it means that you're not going to get uppercutted and need. Uh, you do open yourself up to the guillotine a bit, and it's sort of a trade-off, but there's some great uh, video of Abdul Manap Namagomedov talking about this, Habib's dad, and um, why his team all do it. If you ever saw Habib fight, you know, it's so long ago now, but you know, if you watch Habib fight, he often head fakes first. He head fakes like he's going to shoot with his head in the middle, and then he throws it off to the right when the opponent reacts. Uh, I did that to McGregor in the very opening of their fight, and McGregor jumped for a flying knee, and of course Habib's head was nowhere near. But Grant Dawson kept picking up these head outside singles and then uh, doing a little off balance, like a run the pipe off balance, and, and running around to Ismagalov's back, which was made even better when Ismagalov was trying to wrap his head for a guillotine. Um, yeah, his back control, really lovely. Lots of body triangles. And it's kind of what we talked about, like Gordon Ryan said it before, but there is, in, in even the highest level to jiu-jitsu, people are not reliably getting out of body triangles. They're still doing bullshit escapes like you hear them advising on the commentary, which is to get your body onto the same side as the lock, which makes it uncomfortable for the guy holding the body triangle. But that's about the extent of it. If you ever got your foot broken, doing, or, you know, your ankle broken, um, doing a body triangle on someone, you, would, you wouldn't even bother tapping. You'd just hold the body triangle and continue trying to choke them, you know? So anything like that, like, everyone knows that the cross your leg, you know, trying to footlock people on your own groin when they're on your back, it's stupid. Um, Matt Hughes reached down to try and do like a catch wrestling toe hold against BJ Penn and got promptly choked in their first fight. But everyone knows that's stupid. But the moment you put a body triangle on, everyone's like, yeah, you've got to apply pressure to his ankles. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not going to work. As, as demonstrated in this, Ismagalov would kept, kept changing sides and um, either it didn't work or Grant Dawson would open up his legs and change sides. I really like what um, Ethan... Credenston is doing at the moment with his back control where he gets the body triangle and if the guy go, rolls onto the side with where his uh, ankles are locked he just rolls them through onto their front and a, a face down back mount is generally considered the worst position in MMA for the guy on the bottom because you're getting pounded out from behind and above by shots that you can't see doing that with a body triangle as well upgrades it to an even worse position it's an S rank bad position there we go I did a bit of um, video game streaming this week for the Patreon. Now I'm going to start doing tier lists. And I'll open every episode with my catchphrase. There are levels to this. Oh, I fucking hate it when people say there are levels to this. But there are levels to this. So Grant wasn't able to come close to finishing it, which is a bit of a pain. But um, he did full, full Nelson, is Magalov, uh, from Batman, which is always hilarious. Last The last time I remember seeing that was, I think, Rich Clementi. Against, like, Melvin Gallard. Half Nelson, really powerful position. You can do lots of things from there, from all sorts of different positions. You can do it from mount. You can do it from um, turtle. You can do it from mounted, you know, being on their back. Um, quarter Nelson, also a banging position. Full Nelson was considered, like, the worst hold back in the day, but it's, you can't really do a lot with it. The, it, it only... The really dangerous one is the Princeton bar, which is where you full Nelson someone from um, the turtle. So if you're if you're wrestling with someone in a wrestling match, if you slap a full Nelson on them while they're sort of face down, um, you can turn them onto the back of their neck, which is very dangerous. And I believe banned in basically all wrestling uh, and, and was pretty early on. But the Nelson holds, named after Admiral Nelson, because that's how old they are. And uh, it used to be like, giving someone a good drubbing was to put the Nelson on them. And to be fully Nelsoned was, of course, really bad. But, of course, the problem with a full Nelson from a submission wrestling slash uh, MMA perspective, both your hands are locked up behind their head. What are you going to hit them with? What are you going to submit them with? <laughs> There's not really anything there. You don't have enough pressure behind their head to actually force it down and get the neck crank. So unless you open up your legs and start healing them in the solar plexus, which I think more people should do. BJ Penn used to do that, and it really did tire people out quickly on when he was on their back. Um, and John Tuck TKO'd a guy. Oh, no, it was a, it was a verbal submission. 
he was on the guy's back and he just hammered his heel into their uh, solar plexus and they tapped out. That was in the UFC. It's a legit, it's a legit move that no one's doing. So what else impressed me? Um, well, Benoit Saint-Denis versus uh, Ismail Bonfim. Yeah, man, Ismail Bonfim looked a million dollars against Terence McKinney. I really loved what I saw from him. And I don't think I talked about him on the pre-fight podcast slash Sifu session, but uh, he did really look impressive against Terence McKinney. And he didn't look bad in his um, contender series fight, but he was on a great streak going back to a loss to Moicano back in uh, Jungle Fight. Came into this one, I think, the favourite by quite a large margin. Um, and Sandini, you know, known as a grappler, but came out southpaw, threw a load of left body kicks. Bonfim didn't seem to know how to deal with them. You know, he got hit by the first one. And then after that, he was like, oh, Jesus, and, and sort of running away from every kick. And then uh, Sandini got him down, got on his back, choked him. Very impressive. Uh, did, did the... Uh, championship belt gesture which is always hilarious when you've beaten some unranked guy but a lot of people were very hot on Bonfim and I really liked him in this last one so um, really impressive performance from Saint Denis uh, I think he's on a three fights winning streak now is he yeah Stoltz Miranda and Bonfim all not really heard of names in the lightweight division but um, his one his sole career loss is to uh, Zaleski Dos Santos which he took at short notice a weight class up so you know, it's um, it's always weird when you start in the UFC like that and people get sort of a, you know, you go, well, lost to Zaleski. Zaleski's not very good. And then you realise, well, it was up a weight class and also at short notice. I mean, they just got this guy to fight Jack Della Maddalena at short notice when there's loads. Of, I mean, any time that there's a dropout, loads of fighters say they'll fight. They'll take the fight because it's easy clout. Um but then a lot of them will willingly do it at short notice for more money because that's the expectation. You don't have the time to prepare. Give me more money. And the UFC, rather than giving any of these guys more money, um, anyone, you know, they, they would complain that Kevin Holland's already booked or whatever. But get Kevin Holland, win or lose, doesn't matter. You know, I mean, provided he doesn't get horribly knocked out and then they have to deal with the medical suspension. But there's all these guys saying they'll fight Jack Della Maddalena. There's other guys who are going to compete soon and, you know, you could always just put him off. You could pay him $5,000 to sit on the sidelines for four weeks or whatever. Um, but no, they just went and found a, a random a lightweight from uh, LFA. And someone pointed out, how did they manage to put together this tough tournament with like loads of guys who have bombed out of the UFC, with the exception of Timo Valiev, who didn't. He, he left off one loss. Um, and not find any like new talent. And then as soon as you need a, a short notice guy to fight Jack Della Maddalena, you find an undefeated lightweight from LFA. <laughs> how does that happen? So they're making savings. That's the important point. And all these guys online just defending this decision. Like, I get... No, I don't get. But, you know, I can sort of try and understand you defending the UFC's product as a whole. You know, being like, oh, well, you know, I don't... Maybe they maybe their fighter pay stuff isn't all perfect. But they put on events every week and a lot of them are really good. But to defend a specific decision to make a bad fight... Well, not a bad fight, but a wor much worse fight than you could just to save money. Absolutely daft. Anything else good? Uh, Bruno Ferreira, I was saying before, it took me so long to get on board with Robocop because I was watching him going, doesn't seem that good, but he does seem to be winning. And then I watched Bruno Ferreira's contender series fight before he fought Robocop. And I was like, this guy is sloppy as hell. If Robocop's beaten all these good guys, he should be able to beat Bruno Ferreira. Bru he gets in there, gets sparked because he was confused by Bruno Ferreira's switching stances and throwing one big swing off each side. And I, was, I said afterwards, I was like, I don't think Robocop should have lost that. I think, yeah, that was a really stupid fight for him to lose. And people were like, well, you know, you're just going to get on board with Bruno Ferreira. And I did. I was like, okay, well, maybe he is that good. And I just haven't realised it. And then he came out and immediately got starched, throwing a naked low kick against a guy who's 10 feet tall. And he just caught it on his leg and threw back a right straight down the centre. Um, so good for Ruzo Boy, Ruzo Boy, whatever his name is, Rosie. Sad for Ferreira. I mean, these guys, I think Ferreira and Bonfim both debuted on the same card. And didn't Bonfim's brother also debut on that card? And they all looked amazing. But um, Kevin Lee came back. He fought Renat Fakrenidov, who is on a 10, 15 fight winning streak. I can't remember, but he's he's a legitimately scary man. And uh, he decisioned Brian Battle in his last fight. Was that the one where he... Oh, no, I'm thinking of... Oh, no, no, the Battle one where he did just hold on to him. Um, but Kevin... Yeah, this one he came out and he threw a nice one to hit Kevin Lee right on the chin. That's the thing about Kevin Lee, typically, you know, he's a he's my boy, he's a boy of the podcast, go back and listen to the really old ones he wrote in at one point, but um, 
his boxing, like he's he spent a lot of time working on his boxing. I've seen footage of him at um, the Mayweather gym where they all beat the shit out of each other. But uh, he's got a very long reach. Or he did have an extremely long reach at lightweight. And when he can catch someone on the end of it or keep someone on the end of it, it looks quite, it's, it's pretty impressive. So he did a really good job taking apart uh, Trinaldo. Got hit with an awesome body shot in the process and really badly winded and came back. But um, yeah, he did a really good job shutting down Trinaldo and finishing him. Um, he was doing all right against Tony Ferguson in the, in the first part of their fight, but it is sort of um, just sort of ones and twos. Honestly, his kicking game, like he doesn't have the most flexible look about him. Like he's not one of those guys who easily fl- throws up kicks all the time. But when he has thrown his kicks, they've, they've worked out really well for him. He stunned um, Trinaldo with a high kick and it set Trinaldo up for getting knocked out with his head or knocked down with his hands. Uh, he obviously staggered Gregor Gillespie with a beautiful cross counter across the top of his jab and stepped up into a high kick and one of the prettiest knockouts I've ever seen in any sport. But yeah, this was rough because he just, you know, he got back into the UFC after being promised the world by Eagle FC and then Eagle FC promptly shutting down. Habib being like, yeah, actually, I don't want to do any MMA anymore, actually. Um, After everyone saying that that was going to be the big competitor for the UFC. So Kevin Lee, yeah, he was in a rough situation and uh, he did get back into the UFC and he did re-sign with the UFC. But yeah, they gave him a hard lad and he got hit, hit with a one-two really early dived on a takedown that was a bit messy because he was stunned, and then he got choked by a, a very tight guillotine and uh, left on his face, which is rough, but it's a 55-second loss. I mean, what, not a lot of time to shake off ring rust or anything like that. I mean, he did just go life and death with uh, Diego Sanchez, which was not a great look. I, I have a... Yeah. I think the Kevin Lee thing is weird because I have seen him look really good. Um, Greg Gillespie is legitimately very, very good, and Kevin Lee smoked him. Had no trouble at all. And Kevin Lee's had legitimately great moments against very good fighters. Like, uh, he's had he had his moments against Charles Oliveira. He had his moments against Tony Ferguson when Tony Ferguson was at his uh, prime. He manhandled Michael Chiesa. But people will sort of retcon it and say, yeah, he's never really beaten anyone good. He never looked good. I mean, he beat Trinaldo. He, he stopped Trinaldo's streaks. Trinaldo was on, like, an eight-fight winning streak. And he'd beaten Paul Felder, who they put in to try and stop him being on a streak because they were like, we can't give a 40-year-old Brazilian who doesn't speak English a title shot in one of our busiest divisions. But he also has these maddening moments where he just can't put it together. You know, he, he does he's a very good wrestler. He sh- shoots some weird takedowns sometimes with his head out there. I mean, that's what caught him caught against uh, Oliveira. Uh, and obviously got him caught here, even though he's a mu- much more stunned than he was against Oliveira, where his just body kicks were annoying him. And he has these very long punches, but he also sort of lets people stand inside and hit him. Uh, his footwork can be a little bit on the slow side. Doesn't get the doesn't get the fuck out of dodge like he should sometimes. But Fat Radinov, yeah, I, I mean, if this is the same guy I'm thinking of from that Brian Battle fight where he just laid on him, um, this was a much more interesting performance. Because Brian Battle would have won that fight or should have won that fight if he threw some strikes. He was on the bottom threatening triangles and things, and... Like, the other, the guy on top, Fekradinov, was not hitting him. So it's like, you know, if you just throw some elbows and mark him up a bit, you've got a good chance of winning on the cards here. Joe Anderson Brito versus Weston Wilson. I quite I quite enjoy a bit of Joe Anderson Brito. How is we- Weston Wilson, how is a dude who lost by stoppage to Teruto Ishihara still here? That was blowing my mind when they were talking about this fight. Uh, that was 2022. Oh, okay, that was in XMMA. Okay, I thought he'd lost in the UFC. I was like, Teruto Ishihara has not been in the UFC for years. But this was his UFC debut, as it turns out, for Joe Anderson Brito, who's pretty experienced here, um, and a big first-round finisher. Got dinged, ended up on a leg, and honestly, I thought he was doing pretty much the right thing on the leg. He just didn't, he wasn't able to keep Joe Anderson Brito off balance, and he was getting hammered. And Joe Anderson Brito, like, he got deep into the knee bar. I was very surprised he wasn't, like, limping a little bit when he got up to celebrate, because he was deep in the knee bar, and he was doing the thing where you try and get your other foot on their butt and just kick them off, kick them down your leg. But in the course of doing that, if they're extending your leg, you can get pretty badly hurt. Might not be like catastrophic fight ending injury, but um, it'll, it'll make some pops. And he was there and he was trying to get his leg out and then he basically just went, fuck it, I'm going to punch him. And he punched, he'd like get through a big one, hit him in the chin, kind of Arlovsky versus Pei uh, hit him in the chin and the guy just sort of froze up and he threw five or six more strikes. Very impressive stoppage, but also from like... Snatching it back from a pretty bad position. And the last fight I really want to talk about, because it was great, was uh, Elvis Brenner versus Garam Katataladze. 
Katadalate has been hyped forever because, you know, we saw him in his UFC debut against um, Matuj Gamrot. He uh, really, like, just shook off one of the most scrambly, continuous wrestlers in, in MMA, you know. Uh, Gamrot doesn't always get the takedowns, but he is always working for more. Chain wrestles like a demon, and Katadalate was having none of it and landing these beautiful body kicks. Brennan didn't have a lot of hype coming in. He was the younger guy, he trained with um, Charles Oliveira, but... There's a lot of guys who train with Charles Oliveira. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, Kizatelazzi was, was putting a whooping on him, hit him with a beautiful elbow at the end of the first round, and then hit him with four or five more punches. Brenner has a chin on him, I'll say that. Um, yeah, Brenner got a takedown in the first round, actually two takedowns in the first round. And um, Kizatelazzi played bottom for a while, thought he looked good, used um, grapevines from closed guard to get his butterfly hooks in, start threatening butterfly sweep, uh, went to try and get a, a mere lock, a wizard crank on the, on the shoulder, when uh, that sweep failed. Got back up, broke free, started landing some strikes, and, um, yeah, chinned him with a, a, a few beautiful elbows. It, the, yeah, the really yeah, the really noticeable thing was that Brenner was all punches, and Katataladze was kicks and elbows and punches and knees, and showing far more variety. Even through a couple of overhead elbows, <laughs> Chris Toyoni warned him for the first one, and then just ignored the second, because it was kind of like, are you going to disqualify him for that? I don't think you are. <laughs> you don't seem that invested in it. And he split Brenner's head open and had him, had him bleeding everywhere. Gave, gave him a red hairstyle. Had him looking like a young Annie Lennox. Thought Brenner's takedowns looked good. Seems to be pretty competent on top, but Kutataladze was just very good on the bottom and at getting up. But yeah, as it's all going tits up, Brenner ducks into a clinch, or not a clinch. He has his lead hand low, uh, getting down behind his lead shoulder, as we were always wanting people to do. Goes in as if to clinch. Katataladze doesn't grab him. He doesn't take overhooks. He just assumes that uh, Brenner's going to grab a body lock like he has been the whole fight. And then that's the perfect position for a sneaker. Katataladze thought the other guy was going to grab him, was ready for a clinch, and then uh, instead Brenner comes out with a left hook, hits him right on the neck. Side of the neck, the old karate chop area. Um, you know, Always been a, a, a very legitimate target. You hit someone on the side of the neck, I think you uh, disrupt blood flow to their brain and they, they lose consciousness momentarily, is what I had read previously. But I've seen lots of people do it. Ray Safo used to try and do it in K1. Lots of good boxers looked for it. Neck strikes and throat strikes are usually illegal. In, in well, I'm trying to think of combat sports where they're not. But um, side of the neck, you can sneak in. Because if your guy's got his, uh, his chin down and takes a left hook on, normally it'll hit the neck anyway, uh, if, the, if his hand's not in the way. Still pretty rare to see someone knocked out with one, though. I mean, you know, in Muay Thai, the, the high kick is normally aimed at the neck for the same reason. But the effect was incredible. He just... Kutatalazi was winning the fight, and then he just locked up and fell. So mad respect to Brenner, because he took an ass kicking to get that off. And uh, obviously everyone was like, oh, fraud-checked lightweights. And these guys think that they could call out Chandler and Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje. And like, well, steady on. Different kinds of fighters. Uh, obviously, you know, people either know this and are being obnoxious or don't know this and don't know anything about fights. Someone put up a tweet saying these guys are supposed to be top five lightweights with pictures of uh, Ismagalov and uh, Katataladze's losses. And I was just like, do it with number five ranked Michael Chandler, who's lost to almost as many people as he's been. Every big fight that Chandler's fought, basically. Actually, Chandler loses almost every big fight, to be honest. That's, that's been the story of his career. Alvarez, Brooks, Brooks, Pitbull, Primus. Gaethje, Poria, Oliveira. The only people he's beat of any worth in recent years are, well, Dan Hooker. I mean, Tony Ferguson was completely washed and he managed to give Tony Ferguson his only winning round in the last three years. But that's just me saying that, you know, Chandler's decent. It's just that you know, this this whole thing, like, a, a number two ranked lightweight would never lose to number five ranked lightweight and he'd always beat number three and number four, but he'd lose to number one. It's like, no. The rankings are representative of how people have most recently performed. The whole point is that they move around all the time because people lose all the time to people you don't expect them to. People treat rankings like they're fucking tier lists and it should be that, well, Michael Chandler wins 95% of matchups against the guy ranked one below him and it's just so stupid. Anyway, the other good stuff that happened this weekend was Rise. There was a, oh, actually there was a uh, UFC Fight Pass Invitational, which was a gr uh, Nogi Grappling. Um, fun tournament. It was a lovely giggler sweep by Big Dan. Did a giggler into uh, Mutual Ashy, which links in with what we were talking about in the Pantoja article, which you should read. I'm going to write about Rise and 
the UFC uh, grappling invitational for the Patreon boys, probably Wednesday. The uh, Pantoja article is already up. I was thinking of doing one about um, Rodriguez, but I think I'll just do a deep dive on him on the podcast instead, on the boycast. So if you want to get all that content and not just one a week like some kind of sucker, sign up to the Patreon, support the podcast, enjoy the extra content. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Sean Strickland versus Drickers Duplessis. Bless.